Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. It is 7 p.m. and I call the June 26, 2023 school board meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. Board Clerk Maggie Smith, would you please call the roll? Maggie Smith, present. Bridget Todd Robbins, present. Barb Bunch, here. Crystal Lee, excused. Jennifer D, here. Khadija Islam, here. Chris Lyle, here. Lindsay Mead, here. All right, with seven of the seven board members present, I declare a quorum. I note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With this in mind, are there any changes to this agenda? I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published. So moved. Chris has moved. Second. Is that Barb? Yes. Barb has seconded to approve the agenda as published. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion to approve the agenda as published, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying nay. The motion to approve the published agenda has passed. No public participation this evening. All right, moving on to the district administrator's report, Dr. Mueller. Yeah, I have two things this evening. One, um, we had in partnership with the Home and Area Foundation a very successful golf outing on June 14th. Um, very excited to see um, the funds that were raised. It, they go between our activities department and the foundation, which the foundation grac graciously gives back through um, a lot of our grants for um, staff in our district. So we'll invite them back at another time. And then also, um, we have 12 teaching staff taking part in getting their reading licensure. And this program um, that is taking place, we have our district literacy coach, Tracy Summerfault, and she's facilitating one of the courses. And then we also have um, Tara Schmitz, who will begin in July with a um, course for these teachers. So we're just very proud that our teachers are willing to take on um, getting their reading licensure because we know that only benefits our students. So thank you to them for doing that. Okay, moving on to recognition and thank yous, Dr. Mueller. All right, if uh, Mr. Luloff and Mr. Tashner would like to come up, they have a little recognition here first. I'm Jason Luloff and joined by Ben Tashner. Um, we both just finished our first years and um, I can't speak for Ben myself, but I can say that the spring season itself was a learning curve. Um, and all the more reason to throw a shout out to our officials. Uh, they have to probably stand by their emails or at least check them every hour, almost twice to three times a week to see if games are canceled, moved, delayed, um, different things of that nature. And, and, you know, as just being somebody who's been involved in sports my whole life, I think that's a really overlooked thing is that we don't realize the, the extra time commitment that these people aren't getting paid for, but yet still kind of on the hook for. So uh, a, an extraordinary um, gift of gratitude towards those people who have been working for us in the spring and trying to make it uh, a great experience for our student athletes and um, I just, I'm in awe of like what they probably have to do just to be able to work one of our games and can say that they're probably completely underpaid for, for what they go through in the course of a year, in addition to the weather being a factor. Yeah, and definitely piggybacking off of that, being flexible. And when one of them was supposed to officiate a high school game, but then sign up for me, but then there was changes. And so just being flexible with all of that. Um, and then not only they're having to reschedule those and look for other officials, but if there were some changes, then they had to officiate by themselves, being willing to step up and do that. So I really do appreciate that, especially at the middle school level, so that our kids can have those opportunities. Ben struggles more because the high school pays a, a bigger monetary <laughs> amount, so they generally choose mm -hmm. high school jobs and leave him hanging. So it's all right. We're working. We're working together on that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, I have one other recognition tonight. Um, Mr. Udell, can you sit over there so we can get you on film while I talk about you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so 
uh, Travis joined our team a little over a year ago as our communication specialist, and he continues to, you know, one of the reasons that we um, developed the position is we really wanted to be able to tell our story. And not only tell our story within the district, but really the story of our students and our staff and what really goes on in the doors of a school district to Holman. Um, he's done such an outstanding job and we just want to thank him for that. He just, um, we need a trophy case just for him. No, in our office, no. So we, he um, recently received two awards from the National School Public Relations Association for outstanding school communication. So the, he did a youth apprenticeship with Hale Dayton and that earned an award of excellence. And then the football boot camp received an award of merit. So these, what's so great about this, these are national awards, so they're out there nationally, but then it even gets better. Then he received a Telly Award and the Telly Award receives over 13,000 entries from all 50 states and five continents. Um, the school district of Holman was chosen as a recipient <coughs> with a video highlighting Holman's High School's Career and Tech Ed program um, and department. It was a bronze winner in the promotional video of education. So that's one of the most prestige, prestigious premier programs um, in the world's largest in honoring that type of um, video. So he's getting us known and out there and we thank him for that and we thank our students and staff for bringing these stories um, to us to highlight. So thank you. Thank you, Travis. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we didn't get a picture with you with your trophy because you usually are the one taking the picture. You get a picture with your trophy. <laughs> Did you bring your selfie stick? Ne next meeting. Yeah, you need your selfie stick, sorry. <laughs> All right, moving on to reports and discussion. Um, item 9.1, Holman High School Principal Wayne Sackett and Associate Principal Nick Bakke will now present the report on the Holman High School schedule study. This item is for report only. How come I can't control this? There, oh, there. I was just going too fast. It likes to sleep. All right, uh, Wayne Sackett, principal at high school, and Nick Bakke, uh, principal at high school. We're going to tag team a presentation for you tonight, show you some of the things that we've been working on. Really, the study's been going on quite a long time, but uh, kind of has come to uh, a fruition and, and some good work that we've done this last year. So first off, uh, apologize. Yeah, thank you takes two people to operate this. Um, the reason for the schedule study uh, really began before I even came here 10 years ago. Um, I'll go through the timeline, but really we've really been looking at student achievement and specifically how that achievement um, corresponds with the outcomes that our students realize. Uh, and then that how that ties into our high school strategic plan along with the district dashboard. So our goal really in all of this is compare what we're doing are we doing the right things? Are we spending time, resources, things in the right way for student achievement and outcome? So that's our purpose. And so it kind of a timeline as we go back. Um, the high school transitioned from an eight period, a traditional eight period day. So if you're not familiar with what that is, uh, students might take eight classes, roughly 45 minutes long during a school day. Many schools have sort of a traditional eight period day. And in 1995-96 school year, Holman transitioned from this eight period day to a four block period day where they would have four classes during the course of their day for 90 minutes. And that might run a term, that might run a semester, um, depending on the type of class. So that was kind of the transition from an eight period day to the four period straight block day. Uh, in 2012-2013, this idea of skinnies was introduced, and all the skinny is is really breaking that 90-minute block into two separate classes, uh, or skinnies. So that was introduced for some classes in 2012 and 13, and it just kind of snowballed from there into more and more classes into our current schedule that we have now, kind of a hybrid block skinny situation, which really has really given us some pause to take a look at what we're doing and look at other schools and what they're doing. 
1314, uh, there was some data collected from staff. Are we doing everything that we can do to intervene for our students? Are they understanding? And what are we doing when they're not understanding what it is that we're teaching? And so there was a survey sent to our staff in 2013-14. Uh, 2014-15, which was my first year here in the district, we did a literature review. What is out there in terms of all schedules, any kind of schedule that you can imagine? And we did a literature review back then, along with some school site visits. Uh, we went around the state to take a look at what are some other schools doing that are realizing some success with their uh, students. Then in 2018, you know, things just kind of stayed there. You can just see this humming and, you know, a little bit of angst of, are we going to change? Are we not going to change? What are we going to do? We got to do what's right for our students. So 2018, we collected some input from our staff. And in 2019, we kind of took a look at that and did a force field analysis of that input from our staff in 2019. So it's kind of really the 18-19 school year. And then it kind of sat there again. And you know, just hemming and hawing and not a whole lot done. So this year we really kind of wanted to dig in and make a decision. Are we gonna change or are we not gonna change? And we really did a lot of work. And so I'm gonna turn a lot of this over to Mr. Baki. Our next slide really kind of highlights everything that I just said. Um, but he's gonna share a couple of student schedules with you, kind of um, what that looks like. And then also what it looks like from the staff end and then share some more of the details from the study that we did when we talk this year again with our staff via our guiding coalition, as well as our students. I went into advisories and asked our students of what are the things that they value in their day and what that would look like. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Baki. Okay. Um, so the next slide, this is a screenshot from a, a live student that is gonna be a student for this upcoming school year. And really what I'm trying to do is just kind of, first of all, educate you so you kind of understand what the schedule looks like at the high school. Those of you that maybe have had students or have students, you would understand what this looks like. You understand the pros, the cons, et cetera. But those of you that have never had a high school student, just trying to explain what we're really talking about here so you have some understanding. So for this first current student schedule, one of the gaps or one of the things that we've noticed and on the bottom here, you're gonna see this 1A, that would be what we're calling a skinny. Um, so you notice how this one class is split between first hour blocks. So they have a government skinny class, which is about roughly 45 minutes, and it would run for the whole semester, okay? Um, and then opposite of that, if you look down here on the bottom, you would see that there would be certain block classes that would be running for, and again, I apologize just to clarify here, this here is an ER schedule, so that's why you're gonna see kind of a duplicate, if that makes sense, I apologize. But if you look here down at the bottom for street law, for your fourth hour block, you see it twice, Really what that's, why that's so showing you right there is that it's simply there for our regular everyday schedule. And then on Wednesday for our ER schedule, the times are different. Notice how it says 1246. So that's the difference between those blocks. Sorry, but I'm trying to, it's trying to explain what I'm talking about here. So long story short, the, the example that I'm trying to show is a couple things. First is that's what a skinny looks like. But then more importantly, because that student wanted or took that government skinny class, then they're forced to try to find another class that complements that class to make a full schedule. Okay, this student did not request a study hall. Uh, so I looked in their student requests, they didn't request a study hall, but because there was no other class that fit their requests opposite of government, they're forced to go into a study hall for 45 minutes every day. Not a necessarily bad thing, but if a student wants other classes, like our job is to try to get kids to take classes, not study halls. Um, to uh, highlight on the bottom right of it, you'll notice how it says genocide, animal science, environmental science, and advanced health too. So this would be an example of like the puzzle piece that happens. So if a student wants genocide, then they would have to, in our current schedule, find another class that would fit completely opposite of that, perfectly in there. Otherwise, it would cause another additional study hall. Um, I'm gonna give, pull another example here of another student example. Um, so this student here is a good example of someone that actually worked for most of their schedule. But if you look on the second, on the bottom, it says language nine honors. So that's a year long skinny class. So in order to fill that class, they had to fill it with another skinny for computer apps and a US History 3 class. So that filled their first hour block, which is a positive, but I'm gonna explain some challenges with that as well from a teacher side. Um, but again, additionally, looking at this student's schedule and looking at their requests, the student did not also want a study hall, but they wanted horse and small animals. So they got that class. So in order to be able to have a full schedule, they would have to have another class that would fit exactly perfectly with them term one there wasn't something available, so therefore then they had a study hall. 
Any questions on that first? Just want to make sure I have some clarity around that. And again, I deal with this on a daily minute basis. So I, I apologize. And I just want to make sure that I can explain that for you guys so you can understand what we're kind of talking about from a student build perspective first. Okay. Next now is a teacher, right? So not only are we impacting students, but we're also impacting teachers. And what I wanted to highlight before was the US History 3 skinny. So one of the things that we're gonna talk about is um, the PLC process. So the professional learning process for our teachers, one of the primary four questions is, how do we know if students know it? How do we know if students don't? If they know it, what do we do? If they don't know it, what do we do, okay? Well, one of the challenges that we have in our current schedule is teachers that collaborate on a specific course might be teaching it at two very different paces. So for example, this is a teacher schedule for next year. So this teacher teaches two sections of US3 that are skinnies and they teach on a block, okay? So when they're planning, they are not planning for one class. They are planning for two classes because they run on different timelines. So even though it's the same class, they have different timelines for that have to organize and coordinate and when their tests are and all those types of things. In addition, their counterpart, their, their colleague that they're working on, if they're trying to compare data and one of them is teaching on a skinny and the other one teaches on a block, they can't compare data because they're not taking the tests at the same time. They're not taking formative assessments at the same time. So really all they're doing is talking about timelines, assignments, homeworks, those types of things, but they're not able to get into the deep process of the PLC to really say, how are your kids doing? How are my kids doing? What are you doing that I'm not? What am I doing that you're not? And we can actually collaborate around that and help intervene with students. So this is just a highlight, and this is pretty common. Um, we have blocks and skinnies across the board, as Mr. Sackett alluded to. It started off small, and it just kept getting heavier and heavier. And even since I've been here with the scheduling, I've probably had three to four to five requests or even additional ones that want to go to a skinny or want to go to a block, and that's a challenge. So. To illustrate those visually, other major findings, um, as I kind of illustrated for you, really the gaps in student schedules. So the block skinny conflicts, that's what I tried to highlight from the vision for you to understand like that's a challenge for us because if a student wants a class that's a block class, but then they have to find another block class that fits opposite of that, otherwise they have a gap in their schedule, major issue. In addition, we have an inequity of current teaching assignments. So some teachers are teaching six skinnies. So they have six classes they're teaching. We have some, some departments and teachers that are teaching three blocks, so they only have three classes to teach. Um, and some, as you saw, are teaching on a skinny and a block. So it's all over the place for teachers and departments and those types of things, and that just causes challenges. Um, this is just something to note, is that when they moved, when Holman moved in 94, 95, um, there was no professional development on the block schedule, um, which is a gap, right? So that's an area, a key finding that we found through some of those studies. Strict block schedules limit AP class availability. So for example, um, our AP classes or advanced placement classes, some of them run on a block year long. So our AP Chem, AP Bio, for example, they run a year long block. So if a student wants one of those two classes, that's a fourth of their day gone off the block, off right away. If any other electives that are offered during those same time periods, they, they, don't, they, they just don't have them. Um, other AP classes run off of a skinny year long. Um, and so those really cause conflicts because again, they have to find a complement in our current schedule that would have to be a skinny to fit the skinny. You kind of get where I'm going with this. Um, preparation and national and state assessments. So one of the things in our current schedule is that we have, the, we have students that have gaps of instruction and learning over a course of a year. So for example, a student could come in, have geometry in the fall, sophomore year, and because of our schedule might not take algebra two until the spring of their junior year. So they're not taking a math class for a a year of time. So we would like, as what we're gonna propose, courses that would be running more long, consistent, um, and as you can understand, you know, we understand the summer drop, that this would help reduce that and hopefully help support our students in their learning. Um, there is a more of a preference by our staff to have more block time to allow more work to be done. Um, I'll illustrate that a little bit, especially with the next bullet where it talks, extent, especially with things like labs. So we're really trying to listen to our staff, right? So science, uh, face, CTE, you know, our weldings, those types of activities. It's hard to do a 45 minute class period to get something done in those rooms and then get them out. Um, PE activities, so we have a beautiful rock, ropes climbing wall. Try to imagine to get out there, get strapped in, get up, and then by the time you're doing that, you've already got to get back inside the building. Um, bowling, art classes, et cetera. Those are areas that we really want to try to highlight and which is why we kind of felt like we wanted to have longer class periods. 
Um, also, additionally, lack of collaborative time built in the day with our current schedule and, and the past schedule. This is something that, again, we're working on our daily schedule for next year for our staff to come in in the mornings two days a week to be able to collaborate in the mornings with all their teammates um, to be able to have those. In addition, going back, really getting into the four questions of the high functioning PLC process. We just can't do that right now um, because we have so many staff running or teaching on different um, schedules. And then additionally, response to intervention, time is available on the block better and easier than it would be on the um, skinny. So what are we looking for? So in 24, 25, so we really wanna look, think, look out. Why? Because we wanna be able to provide that professional development. We wanna get ourselves ready to go um, for 24, 25. Our proposal is gonna be to that we're gonna be moving to what's called an AB block day. So all, what that really means is an alternating block every other day. Um, kind of like our middle school. So those of you that are functioning in the middle school world, you kind of have the H day and the V day. However, the difference there versus us is that every class would operate on every other day. So you, we wouldn't have the electives or the specials that are kind of a little bit different in the middle school. So every class would run on an every other day block. Um, my table there, as you can see, so your A day would be your first hour class. We would have advisory, a second, third, and fourth hour class. Then on your B day, following day, you'd have your fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth hour class. Um, Understanding change is not easy, right? So as you know, change is not easy for anything. Um, there's different viewpoints, perspectives, needs for support for our staff. Um, why did we go to the AB? As you could kind of hear, a lot of the, the AB kind of solves a lot of the issues or the gaps that we talked about previously. Um, in addition, this isn't the end all be all, but we also want to look at our peer districts. Menominee Falls and River Falls for the last nine years on average are one of our peer districts. They have been outperforming us. Menominee Falls is number one, they run an AB schedule. River Falls runs an AB schedule. There's a little bit different, um, but overall, these are the model schools that we're trying to uh, become um, and quite frankly, outperform. And so um, we've built some professional connections with both of those school districts already, um, in addition to Brookfield East and Pewaukee who also run modified AB schedules. So we've reached out to other professional communities to help learn what they've done, how they've done things um, to be able to do um, and obviously to have the transition go as smooth as it can. So again, structurally, it's really an eight period schedule. So if you think of eight classes, there's eight periods, eight classes that students can pick, and then they're just simply gonna meet for the longer period of times and they just rotate every other day. That's ultimately kind of what it looks like. Um, it uses our current build. So most of our classes are built on a block. So it actually has less of an impact than if we would switch to something like an eight period day. And all courses would run on a consistent schedule. So every course would be end dated and semester graded, semester credits given. Right now we have credits given all over the place, um, term credits, semester credits, year long credits, et cetera. Um, consistency, um, so going into growth and positives is consistent. I can't highlight this enough. A lot of this is on the back end that some people don't necessarily see, but the impacts that this has on students and staffing is, is immense. So our grading is gonna be consistent. So every, we'll have consistent final schedule at the end of each semester. Right now, we have final schedules after the end of term one, but you might have a semester skinny. So then they're sitting there saying, well, what are we, what are we doing? We, we're not, we don't have a final. So everything would be semester graded. Everything would be finals. Credits would be earned at the same time, less of an impact on our current schedule. Um, common course alignment, like I kind of mentioned, Every course would run on the same time frame. So when they're meeting as a professional learning community, they would be able to finally share the data with one another and compare and contrast and say, how can we do better? How can we improve our students? Um, this would improve that student choice pairings by reducing conflicts because we're not gonna have all these different systems running at the same time and trying to make them fit. Also a major thing that we actually heard from a lot of our peer districts is that there's less frequent and more common transitions in the building. Right now, someone might have a block, but in the middle of the block, there's kids in the hallway running around because they're doing transitions. So we have kids kind of in the hallway at all times. This would reduce that down. And what that tells us is there's more kids in the seats in the class learning versus in the hallway. Um, relationships and routines. Right now, it's a nine week class for some students and staff, and they're moving on to the next group. This allows 18 weeks, right? Longer time to be able to develop relationships, routines in the classroom. Um, and kind of going back to what I highlighted before, continuous learning by reduction of the gap, right? So someone wouldn't take English 10 in the fall and not take English 11 until the spring of the following year um, to be able to highlight the gaps. 
Um, FTE is consistent, right? So we're going to change that. So everybody would be teaching on a three block, uh, three block day, three to six teaching periods uh, currently, as I've talked about. Um, there's some reduction and restructuring to certain courses. Some there's some marketing and business and PE, for example, they're starting to reflect on their own courses and they're saying maybe we could run ours as a semester, which would help with the pairings and I think some more opportunities for their students to take it. Turnover time for tests. This came up from one of our ELA teachers. They said they used to teach on an AB block and something we didn't think about, but they said when I have a paper turned in on Monday, I don't need to stay up all night Monday night to get those papers back to those students on Tuesday. I have until Wednesday now. Um, which is something that I never thought about, but they came up to me and brought that up and I said that is an excellent highlight. Um, question, people ask, you know, can we still do college now, early college credit, youth apprentice? Yes, we can do all that because we can coordinate that right into the schedule. We can actually be more creative. So somebody might be able to go a YA every other day. Right now they have to take it for a block every day. They have to be dismissed whether they're working or not. So maybe we can even coordinate where they can take a class in addition to their YA. Daily schedule, minimal impact based upon what we already have, response to intervention would be in the classroom. Limitations, being transparent, right? This isn't a perfect thing. I have that on the bottom, but I think that's important to highlight. Like we know that this isn't perfect. There is not a perfect schedule out there. Um, one of the limitations is acceleration. So some people, the problem that we have right now, a current schedule, somebody could double up on a world language, for example. They could take Spanish two in the fall, Spanish three in the spring. So we would not be able to do that in our next schedule because that course would run a year long. Now, I wanted to look at some data with that. When we looked at data over the last three years, that's only affected five to 19 students between the math and the world language, which is pretty much the only area that they double up. Um, but it's over the last three years, five to 19 of our 1200 kids that that would impact. Um, remediation is another one. So we do have currently our system where if someone fails government, for example, term one, they could retake it for term two. Um, when I looked at that, those are our three year night averages of somebody that has actually done that. So we had 19 one year of kids doing that. The last two years we've had nine kids doing that. However, as I've presented to you guys before, we have a phenomenal recovery summer school section that we can still offer as an opportunity um, for those students. Um, a major change is that there is going to be current time all allocations that would change specifically advanced courses with AP Chem and AP Bio just being transparent. Like those courses, those educators will have to reflect on their courses. They've taught on a year long block. How would that look for running on an every other day to be able to have that class be still be completed? Um, additionally, adaptive physical education. I think this is actually an opportunity. I've talked with Mr. Bagneski about it. Current light right now, students who take APE or adaptive physical education, take it for roughly 90 minutes, even though necessarily their IEPs do not require that. This would allow them to be able to take it every other day, which would match with bands or choirs or other electives or opportunities for them to be able to take. Um, structural change to some courses. Some courses right now run on a skinny, so they will have to reflect on how to be able to go to the block. Um, most of those ones that I've just highlighted, some examples like our ELA 9 and Algebra, they're excited. So there's a lot, I mean, it's a change, but um, there's a lot of excitement there. Financial resources. So we don't really know what this looks like, but. Historic in the past, you know, if someone has two of the same classes the same day, they might have one guest speaker that can be there for both. That guest speaker might have to come back the next day, just trying to come up and highlight some different things that we know will be there. And I think last, which is most important that we understand, it's not gonna be perfect. Um, we still will probably have gaps, um, but we're hopefully trying to reduce them absolutely to the most we can possibly do that. So what are our next, <clears throat> excuse me, what are our next steps and some things that we additionally need to address. First thing is professional development. You know, listening to our staff and what didn't happen in, in, uh, when we transitioned from the eight period day to the four period day, we need to make sure we're providing professional development to our staff. And that's not a bad thing. Um, we need to really make sure we're mindful of how we're engaging our students. I mean, it's hard to sit there for 90 minutes and sit and get. We want to get them up and moving, get them doing hands-on activities and just really dig into that professional development. Uh, Nick mentioned our professional learning communities and our curriculum, making sure everything's aligned. And Nick talked about some of the changes of, oh, maybe we can move this to a semester course. So there's some work that needs to be done there as well. Um, our resource allocation and our budget planning, you know, what is that going to look like? Well, our budget's our budget. We've kind of been using that all year, but it just might have to be allocated different times of the year um, and, and how we're working through that, along with some of our resources, like how are we using our textbooks? 
or some of those other areas that we might need to address and things maybe we don't even know about right now as our teachers talk. Uh, communication is going to be really key. Clear is kind, unclear is unkind. So we really need to take some time and explain this to our students, to our families, why this is really beneficial towards student achievement and um, their outcomes so they realize success in the long run. Um, and then really working with our student services team and our counselors, you know, they, they're all the time working on four-year plans. We have four-year plans for all of our students and how is that gonna change? And it's gonna impact our required graduation credits, but really what's gonna drive this is the elective credits and what choices do they now have available to them because of all the conflicts that Nick kind of explained to you with the different schedules. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, in a thought process as we transition uh, to this. And then make some determinations. You know, Nick presented, you know, maybe A days, one, two, three, four, and then B days, five, six, seven, eight. Well, maybe we do A day as an odd day. It's one, three, five, seven, and the B day is an even day, two, four, six, eight. So make some decisions with that. What is the early release going to look like? and have those discussions, or if we had a late start, what that, would that look like? And let's just talk about inclement weather days. We don't want to have them, uh, but they might happen. And we have too much snow or we have you know, super cold weather, and how are we gonna address those situations where you know, Teacher X has this, uh, a guest speaker coming in and now we have a cold day, and how are we gonna handle some of those things? So there's work to do yet, and some wrinkles to iron out, for our next steps and areas to address, but um, we got a, a really good lion's share of the work done and really feel good about this plan. Questions for Nick or myself? Yeah, well, thank you. That was a great presentation. I enjoyed that. <coughs> um, so will all of the courses then either be a semester or a year, or are some of them still gonna be on a term? Nothing will be on a term. Nothing so be they'll on a term. all be on semester, but there might be courses. There would be, so like your ELAs, your cores, so your ELAs, your sciences, or ELA uh, math would run year long every other day. Yeah. So right now your ELA 9 runs a year long skinny, but that'd be an every other day block. ELA 10, for example, runs on a semester block. It'd be an every other day block for the whole year. So we don't have those gaps. Um, and then electives would flesh in there at semester and um, other courses too. So now if study hall happens, it would have to be a 90 minute study hall. Right? Which it does currently most right now, like that one example that still can happen. Um, but the nice thing about it is it would be every other day for a semester and the students would be taking seven classes versus right now a kid could get block, locked into a study hall for 90 minutes and only take three other classes. Mm -hmm. And so they're every day they're in that 90 minutes where this would be an every other day thing. And we, I want to be transparent. Some students want study halls and we will still help support them in that. We just, it's really hard for us when we have to force a kid into a study hall, when they want to take classes, uh -huh. and we just say, yeah, but you can't because it's not off, like this is what's available. And again, we're still going to have that, but it will reduce drastically compared to where we are right now. Uh -huh. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of a college schedule, really. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And Any other questions? I just wanted to say, I just commend you on all the work that you put into it. And as a parent with an incoming freshman, this topic of scheduling has come up a lot with other parents recently, and I think that everything that you talked about tonight, I think a lot of folks will have sighs of relief going forward. I know this will take a year to really mm -hmm. implement, but um, everything you listed as positives, I think, um, are just amazing. So yeah, appreciate all the work you put into this. Is this going to have any effect on the variety of electives that you're able to offer or I was thinking that maybe are there going to be classes that can only be offered like every other year well we do that currently um, but not because of our schedule um, we that was something when I took over as master schedule to kind of I tried to help work with a lot of departments because what we were doing is we were offering all of these electives all the time and so teachers would end up having to teach like a, I always call them like a one-off so like you, you have a couple of US history and then you got to just teach us one elective and you don't have anybody else to collaborate with. And so I've been actually working with a lot of departments and having doing a lot of cycling with courses, especially electives, to help create more of a collaborative culture so that they might teach instead of one every year, they might teach three or four every other year and now they can collaborate. So would this have an impact on that directly? I, don't, I wouldn't say any different than what we're already trying to work on to be able to have courses being taught at the same time to help create some of that collaborative piece. 
And if you have a specific question, I, I can help it readdress it. Or if you have a specific it, it, content, I guess. It may allow for more opportunities for students too. Like if we have, I don't know, we're at that cut point where we can only one, run one AP biology class. Yeah. We now might be able to run two AP biology class, and now all of those kids get the class with other things in their schedule where we might, may not have been able to do that currently. And so we got a cut. Like, we can't put 38 kids in a classroom, and eight of them aren't going to get the class. That's not fun to look at anybody and say, you can't get this class. Cause and those advanced classes are probably the hardest ones that we have to make those hard calls on. Because we know if someone signs up for AP Lit, for example, if there's 25 kids, I know that that's a skinny and that's going to have to run against everything else. And 19 or 18 of them might get it. Whereas now with a bio, for example, if there's 32 kids, we would run one section because we knew that they're not. Well, now we could maybe run two and run 16 to 18 kids per one to make to make more course offerings. And maybe a kid could double then. Um, I... <laughs> It's very fun for me to listen to this because I was a student who did a lot of AP classes and did a lot of skinnies, and I remember it's taking me back to a very stressful time of trying <laughs> to get all my courses. Uh, the fact that uh, Mr. Luloff is here makes me feel a little guilty of the fact that I had to waive a PE credit so that I could keep all of my AP courses. Yeah, cover your ears, please. Yeah. Um, one, So I, I appreciate this, and I can, I can see kind of the vision and the way that you're going. A question that I had for you that gets back to Jennifer's comment about um, it being kind of like a college schedule. I remember I'm looking at like the advanced placement courses for chem and bio. I remember when I was in college that there was a day that was the classroom day and there was a day that was a lab day. So I'm curious if the AB schedule could present an opportunity where like your A day is your classroom day and your B day is your lab day. So you're not missing that instruction. I think that's work we do with our teachers. You yeah. know, as they're planning together, you know, to to run a lab and what day is the lab if, you know, today we're doing a chemistry lab or, you know, what that looks like and prepping the chemicals for things like that. So I don't know that we want to micromanage. Sure, of course. Uh, our staff because they are, you know, well-versed and experts for each of their classes. And so I think we would work together to try to, to work that out and figure that out. I would say with that, we'd, have to, we'd want to be very mindful um, because if we would what we're kind of saying is that we we're going to do a lecture on one day and a lab on another day. And what, what did we just create? We just created a year long block class again. So it's kind of what we're trying to avoid. And I think there's, those aren't easy decisions. Um, but those are kind of the decisions that we might need to make to say, nope, we're going to run it as a, every other day and see what it looks like. Um, and then trial it and then maybe reflect later. But I think that's something, and we've had staff come and ask us and talk to them, and we've been just trying to say, I understand, I hear you, I hear you, I do, and um, we know that it's not easy, but this is something we got to try to stick to and try to try to really fix the problems, because the minute we start creating exceptions, guess what? We're going to be back here in eight years and say, hey, remember, well, we changed it in 2023, and staff feedback, and here we are again in five years saying yeah. we got to change it. And, and to be clear, I wasn't saying, you know, to make exceptions. I was suggesting, like, okay, I have chemistry on this A-Day. And we're going to prep for lab for two days from now. So we might get my lab report already. What are we going to do? Do that front-loading work before we actually go into the lab. So there might be some activities, some things like that to prep for the day that we do have class again for the lab. I also appreciate what you said, though, about keeping kids engaged the whole time because it is longer. So you, you might not want to have them sitting for 90 minutes on one yeah. day and active the others, split it up, get them moving. Uh, I also appreciate just everything and all the research that went into this. You guys did a really great job and I appreciate getting feedback from the teachers and the students. I was curious if you could share a little bit what the students think of this from the times you talked with them. Sure, that's, uh, so we really tried to ask them what do they value? Sometimes that's hard for a teenager to really share what they value because they go to what they know. Um, but a lot of what they shared was they want to be engaged uh, in their classes. And so, you know, our professional development to make sure we're really working with our staff to utilize the block schedule into shorter chunks of time is really going to help with that. They really wanted extended periods of time. Um, some of them didn't. I'll be, you know, I'll be transparent. Some of them didn't want, you know, extended periods of time but when you look at the things that we're trying to do with a chemistry class you know science class biology class a PE class you, by the time you get out of the locker room and changed and did 
get doing what you're going to do, and then it's time to head to the showers again. So, um, but they, those were the big things as they did really like extended periods of time. They did really want to be engaged in their classes and break things up. So, um, a lot of great feedback from a lot of different, you know, I went into senior advisors, uh, homerooms and I went to freshman homerooms and the freshmen obviously didn't have a lot to say because they haven't been through, you know, a whole lot of a high school experience yet. And when we did Mr. Sackett talk with students, we didn't present this, right? right? So we wanted to come to you first, obviously. So we didn't say, okay, what do you think about the AB? Because really, when we collect that feedback, we want to look at the holistic 10,000 foot things, right? And then all of a sudden we say, okay, what schedule fits that? And then, so now our next step will be to really connect with those students. I'm sure they probably also said they want to open lunch, start about 1030, right. be done by one, <laughs> optional days. There, there, the, the, <laughs> there were some good ones. An, an additional question was asked, if you could change one thing, what would it be? And those were a lot of the things that <laughs> we did here as well. All right, excellent, Thank great you. presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. All right, moving on to item 9.2. Matt Myers will now present the academic and plan and career planning presentation in his role as Director of Safety and Student Services. This item is for report only. Yeah, he is in that role yet for a few more days, so we have to make <laughs> sure he gets one more presentation in. <laughs> his dual role. All right, we're gonna take a look at uh, what happens after our students navigate the high school schedule. So we'll uh, take a look at their post-grad outcomes. So looking at our Holman High School graduates, um, we're going to take a look at some of the things that they do. Here's just kind of the statutory requirements here for what we'll look at tonight, which is our graduates intent, enrollment, um, persistence, and graduation. This is a part of our district's ACP plan, or what we sometimes refer to as career readiness. We'll highlight some of the things that go on um, within that plan, either directly inside that umbrella or maybe even outside of it when we're unintentionally delivering some career readiness skills um, throughout the day, just as a part of our general curriculum and school experience. You'll note that our E4E plan had previously come to the board in February. That's a component of this as well, but not something that we'll specifically talk about tonight as we've already gone through that. Then we get into some of the numbers. Um, so we'll look at first starting with intent. Our students take a survey um, when they graduate. You'll note maybe just a fewer number of students in 2021 actually completed the survey. Our ratios look pretty similar though to the class of 2022. Um, since we had data that we pulled from April, we are looking at two different classes tonight. So we'll look a little bit at 2021, um, but also wanted to include our 2022 graduates as long as we had data available to to us. Um, so you'll see just the differences in the two classes there. And occasionally I'll reference some um, information from our 2020 graduates as well. Some of our students you'll see um, looking specifically at 2021, these are our students who enroll in college. That can be a two or four year institution immediately after high school. You'll see that dip in 2021. These are um, kind of attributed to some pandemic years. The national trend was that there was a 9.2% drop from 2019 enrollment right after high school um, and the 2021, the class there. So uh, returning to school or starting school um, during those COVID times. And some of that time was uncertain or um, pandemic era protocols were in place that maybe students didn't want to begin college, wanted to delay that a little bit. So that's why you'll see a little bit of a dip there and a nice recovery in 2022. Um, looking just at any time, so you'll see just a slight increase. Um, this would catch a couple of those students who maybe didn't decide to go back in the fall, but did for that spring semester. And each one um, represents about two or three students that would choose that pathway in 2021 and 2022. We can't um, disaggregate this data much and see who some of these students are because they technically no longer belong to us. They're college students, so we kind of lose our educational right to know some of this information. One of the ways that we can do this is with gender, and you'll see those trends just kind of mirroring each other over time. Um, 2021 dropping, but the 2022 recovery looks nice. And it's fairly common nationally and across the state that um, our female students outnumber our male students in terms of college attendance.
Looking at just the different um, institution types, public or private, you'll see some of the same trends, not much of a difference there um, between enrolling if you were choosing public or choosing a private institution. We have a little broader view here. Um, if students did take that, um, to take that year and decide that they wanted to do something different in 2021, you'll note about a 5% increase there with the class who may have chosen to do that a year later. So anytime within those first two years and that 2022 data would stay the same, that second year cohort data not available to us yet. And by gender, you'll note some of the same trends as we looked at previously. And then uh, institutional type there, we're looking at public and private, and that's just, again, collecting two years worth of information on that class of 2021, which we did see about a 4% increase there um, in students there um, for that class. Specifically, um, looking public-private and immediate enrolling immediately after high school um, outlook, just seeing it's a pretty similar curve as well as we've looked at some of those previously. Here's an interesting one that's always cool to look at, seeing where our students are choosing to go. So um, we have some just minor switches this year. Uh, Mankato and Platteville kind of battle it out. Platteville was the winner. He took a big jump a couple of years ago, um, but now Mankato has kind of evened that out. So we're staying pretty consistent. Usually our top 10 is our top 10, and there's some minor switches between those. Um, we have seen an increase, a slight increase in Stevens Point enrollments, but when we're looking at some of those numbers being in the teens or even low 20s, those two to three students can make a big difference in where you rank on this map. And then um, there's about 15 more students than uh, last year's version, the class of 2020 included in there, um, that attended Western. So. And then always our outlier here um, is Arizona State, which I completely understand um, after some Wisconsin winters. <laughs> Uh, another thing that we look at is persistence. So persistence is really defined as continuing college, not necessarily continuing at the same institution. So we'll have um, no data there for 2021 because those students haven't completed two years because you'll see these reports are pulled um, effective in April. The clearinghouse matches our graduates three times a year. So we'll get that data in the fall that will be available to us. So the most recent class we can look at uh, is 2020 and you'll see um, some good persistence there going um, above our average, just slightly above the typical average that we've had. So students continuing down that pathway in college. Also important to note, this can be a two-year or a four-year college. Looking at who, who is persisting, who has that freshman to sophomore persistence, um, this just breaks it down here by public and private institutions. Just interesting, an outlier um, would be, notice a big dip in private institution persistence for that class of 2020. We'll see if that's a trend that would continue over time or just maybe a one-year blip that was impacted by a couple students. And then we also take a look at um, institutional levels, two and four-year institutions. So you can see um, overall the four-year institution slightly higher in terms of persistence, but some good uh, levels there at our two-year institutions as well. And then just looking to see uh, does in and out of state impact anything in a breakdown in that regard. And then finally, we track, um, or our clearinghouse tracks for us, I should say, but a data that we like to look at um, is our, our six-year enrollment and progress. So looking at um, some of these students who have been in college or enrolled in college in 2015, 2016, and what they achieved during that time. So you'll see that 49.1% um, of our graduates have graduated some form of college, whether that be a two or four year institution. 26.2% uh, of our percent of our graduates have never um, appeared in the clearinghouse, which could be maybe their school doesn't report there, or it could be that those are students who did not choose a two or four year college, they chose a different pathway for their career. And I always think it's interesting to figure out who those 2.6% of students are who are graduating within a year there of their enrollment in college. It's very impressive. <laughs> And 
And then Jill's gonna talk us through how we track some of the data for our special education students. So um, as a district, we are required to follow the state performance plan. And part of that is um, we have 17 indicators to follow. Indicator 14 deals with post-secondary transition. So when Matt has been creating this PowerPoint the last couple of years, I thought, why don't we add some of our data that we have to collect because it aligns with what he's collecting. So this is the first year we're presenting on this, but I think it's really important for you to know, especially as we have three transition programs in the district. And so for you to, to know and understand that that is a requirement of our school district and our state to report out on post-secondary transition. So that's what indicator 14 um, is. And so the state collects this data. Um, and then, so first of all, it collects data on um, the, the students who are a year out. So just like Matt was talking about, this is looking, this part, primary, this chart is just the 2000, 2001 exiters. Um, and so we look at a couple of different categories. We look at one, whether students are enrolled in higher ed. Two, whether they're competitively employed. Again, that's all within one year of leaving us. And three, they might be in some other post-secondary or some type of training or employed, but not competitively. So that might mean they're working in a sheltered workshop. It might mean that they're working as a volunteer um, as they gain experience to hopefully be competitively employed. So those are the different categories that um, we use. And as you can see, again, this is the data from tw um, the 20. 21 exiters um, and so we have seven students out of that co um, cohort of 35 respondents that are in higher ed we have 11 that are in competitive employment and then we have six that are employed or attending some type of training it might not be consecutive days um, or a, a consistent process uh, consistent work environment the other part of this is um, in order for us to gather this information, we have to do surveys. We have to collect information on the students that are leaving us. And we have the choice of whether we have our staff call them or have St. Norbert's call them. And we had St. Norbert's call one year since I was here and we had a pretty low response rate. So we went back to have, and we were required to use them that year. We, it wasn't an option. And since then, um, the state has allowed us to use our staff because we get a much higher response rate. Our students, our former students, love to hear from our staff. It's usually our school psychologist, our transition coordinator, and they know the students really well. And so they love connecting with the students and the students vice versa. So that has been really Really fun for them. Um, so our response rate is very good. And then um, the second part of this is we're also given an incentive grant to continue um, to work on transition, to continue to facilitate employment for our students with disabilities. And so the funds are based on the number of participants in the survey and whether they're eligible, so whether they qualify for any one of those category, categories I mentioned. So for this particular group of exiters, um, we were able to generate um, about seven, a little over $17,000. So that's pretty, pretty nice. Um, and again, kudos to our staff who are giving those phone calls and our, our former students who are responding. This is um, a three-year look at our survey data for our students with special education needs. Um, as you can see, our response rate, which is on the far right, is pretty, pretty good for students with um, disabilities who are a year out and, and plus. Um, and it's just continuing to increase. So again, I attribute that to our, our staff who are making the phone calls. And then um, just a couple of um, reflections based on looking at this information. Again, we are seeing a pretty stable or steady um, about 25% of our students in higher ed. We would like to continue to increase that competitive employment. And while doing that, we'll be working with um, the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation to really work on some um, more embedded job skills within the high school and then beyond in our transition programs and elsewhere. And then also continuing our partnership. So right now we partner with Goodwill um, to, to have some job skill development. We partner with our uh, many different departments in our high school and beyond, but would really like to see us partner with some more local Holman businesses and, and community organizations. So those will be the things that we'll be working on for the future. Any questions? Any questions? 
our district's career readiness um, team. So we mentioned our ECP plan. Um, we're meeting and met and worked through our district's E4E plan, which we brought earlier. Um, we're kind of reviewing our portrait of a graduate work right now. Um, what, what is the outcome? What do we want a Holman graduate to look like, so to speak? And we have plans to further this work in combination with our career readiness skills. Um, and we have a core group that's had the opportunity to meet, but we want to expand. We know that career readiness is not just uh, certain disciplines. It can be every discipline. So we want more representation there. And that um, just touches on a portion of the work that goes on, whether that be um, through our school counseling program. Some of you as parents have had the opportunity to participate in individual planning conferences with students or developing four-year plans for students um, within our platform of Zello and the many experiences that are provided at the high school level, such as our Trade Tuesdays, um, just different career experiences, youth apprenticeships. There are always people visiting. Um, when Mr. Sackett and Mr. Baki spoke about guest speakers, they are definitely right. There are plenty of them and great experiences for our students. Any questions about the presentation or data in general? We just highlight um, some of this came from our senior exit survey and most of our data comes from the National Student Clearinghouse. All right, any questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 9.3, Executive Director of Instructional Services, Kim Edwards, will present the required annual notification of academic standards. This item will appear on the July 10th consent agenda. Good evening. So yes, as required by statute, about this time every year, I come before you to um, provide notification of the academic standards to be adopted for the upcoming school year. So this report and consent agenda item is to provide notification to parents and guardians that the school district of Holman has requested approval by the Board of Education to adopt the next generation science standards and then the Wisconsin academic standards for all other content areas. We do um, post the adopted standards on the instructional services website as well as all of our curriculum documents as well. So if anybody wants a deeper dive, those are always available out there. So any questions about adoption of the standards? Questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 9.4. Kim Edwards and Dr. Mueller will present the district survey results for report only. Oh, I get to do yes. this start. So um, we are here to provide you with an overview of um, the results that we obtained from the um, district surveys that um, were distributed. Um, they come out from the Instructional, uh, Instructional Services Department every year. Um, we actually, they, we have data going back to 2011. Um, there have been some edits, so some updates to the um, surveys, but in general, we have some great longitudinal data that we can fall back on. This year, we administered it from March 21st to April 11th. That's roughly the same window that we use, have used the last several years. It does go out to three different stakeholder groups. Um, our families, our students in grades three through 12 receive um, the survey and then all of our staff. Um, below then you'll find the participation from each of our stakeholder groups. Um, it's an approximate um, level of participation because we find that some people start the survey, don't end it or pick and choose which questions they want to answer. So we don't, we have varying um, responses on all of the questions. So that's why you see an approximation. You'll notice that um, our result or our uh, participation per particular, particularly for our families at 14% is a little bit lower, um, but it is consistent with what it was actually prior to pandemic. So during the pandemic years, we tended to have um, much more participation, but now it's kind of fallen back to what it has been historically. So what we're going to do is give you um, an overview of the results um, for each of the um, sections that each of the that the surveys are divided up into. So we'll give while we have um, we collect data for each of the at the building level, we're going to provide you the district level overview. So the first one that we go into is student learning. Um, so each of the stakeholder groups essentially get a form of the same question. So the first one pertains to do we have high expectations for student learning? And you will see um, across all three of our stakeholder groups, um, they agree that we have exceptionally high um, expectations for student learning, which is very exciting. When we look down at our expectations for student behavior, 
I should note that 90%, we're always street striving to do better, but 90% at least is our goal. Um, you'll see that um, it's a little bit lower for our staff. Our students and guardian, parents, guardians feel we have a little bit higher expectations. Our staff is actually a little bit lower. It's consistent with um, 22, but um, a little bit lower historically. Oops. Okay. Uh, then when we look at um, do our, our students get um, academic support when they need it? Um, these results are really pretty consistent for our students. It's usually in the upper 80 percentile range. Um, staff, it was a little bit lower. We're usually in the lower 90s, but it's really pretty close. And then um, our parent guardian response was very consistent in the lower 90s. Um, the last question under student learning has to do with um, do we encourage our students to try difficult things, difficult tasks? These were also quite consistent with previous um, data that we've collected. Um, students tend to view it a little bit lower than our, our staff and then our parents and guardians, um, but again, pretty consistent within you know, a percentage point or so. <clears throat> okay, then the next area was our leadership area and the first question was basically, does my principal or supervisor listen and respond to my concerns? And the parent, gar guardian, staff, nine, above 90%. Now students, um, one of the reasons I think this could be this is they have many different trusted adults that they go to in a setting. So this was geared directly to um, the principal, um, which they might feel someone else as a trusted adult to speak to even though 81% is pretty high. Um, and then, um, is my principal supervisor available to talk with me? Um, there, I think that's really important, um, feeling comfortable to approach and to be able to talk to that uh, adult in that role, and all of them are above 90%, which we strive for. Then this here, these are questions that are only um, given to our staff um, about our leadership. And I'm um, just happy to report it's pretty consistent that the majority are really almost all above our 90% goal. Um, the one area, asking for my opinions and suggestions, um, it's very close to our 90%. And you know, having stakeholder input groups, we've worked hard to have listen and learn sessions and just really involve groups in the guiding coalitions and PLCs and so on. Um, so there's lots of, and then, you know, the survey and so forth, there's lots of areas where we do um, ask for perceptions in that. Um, as we know, a lot of people have different opinions and suggestions, and so just listening to those and being open and continuing to strive to improve this is something that we'll do. Um, recognition, I thought this was very interesting. Um, recognizing our students and staff for the good things that they do. Our parents feel that there's lots of great recognition going on. Um, our staff are average in that, and then our students were the lower. So really trying to figure out how do students like to be recognized um, and what does that look like? So really digging in and asking them more questions. Um, I know there's a lot of recognition of our students that goes on on a daily basis, so it's just finding out what does recognition mean to our students? Because um, you never know nowadays, it might be something that some of us in the older generation might not realize or understand. So we'll have to dig a little deeper into that. Um, once again, here's um, personal contributions and capabilities. Um, these were only asked of our staff. So really, how do they feel they contribute to the district and to the school district of Holman? And the majority of them you can see are in, in the 90s, upper 90 percentiles, so really feeling like they're contributing to the success of the district. Um, having the opportunity to develop their professional skills, um, that's where time gets to be hard. Um, many of their job duties, they're consistently with kids and with students, so finding that time to continue to um, develop and provide those opportunities for them and finding time to do it when they are here and available. That's where the challenge comes into play. And then communication. Um, people are feeling that they're being provided timely information on dates and activities, which is really important. We want to make sure that people know what's happening and going on. I think with the addition of the communication specialist, that's definitely helped also being able to get out our communication in multiple formats. 
Um, and then knowing the vision statement, um, the belong, serve, succeed. Our staff seem very clear on that. Um, we're just kind of, we've had discussion about this. If maybe people don't know what we mean by vision statement, maybe the terminology, or we do know buildings have, and departments have different vision statements than the district statement, and that could be another reason for the 70 percentile, because we are striving for 90. So that's one that we ponder still to this day. So welcoming environment. This is the one area um, that you know we obviously have very friendly and helpful um, when you walk into our buildings administrative assistants are there to help they're there you know for our staff and students very high ratings that was one of our areas to celebrate and we thank them for their service um, the question around belonging so belonging is part of our vision statement um, we really strive hard and have been working on this so this has been on our survey for three years now the belong you know, I feel that I belong at school. My family feels that they are a part and belong as part of the school district. And I just wanted to, um, so the students, the first year we did it, they had an 82%. Then the second year it went to 68 and then it increased to 69. We do see that this is an area that we need to um, put some work to and, and build into our strategic plan. You know, how do we make our students feel like they belong? Um, as far as our uh, parents, um, they have been pretty consistent, 90, 89, 89%. So that's been pretty consistent, but our goal is 90%. We wanna make sure that they feel that. And also reflecting on, we should probably be asking our staff this question. So that's another thing as we keep looking at our survey and updating. So my looking forward to coming to school. Um, this has been on the survey. I went back to 2015 because I saw that 63%. Well, in 2015, it was actually 59% for the students. And then it was in the, it's been in the 60s ever since. So we were talking in, when we were reflecting on this saying, I look forward to coming to school. Well, how does a student perceive that? Is that, well, I can come to school or I wanna go do something else outside of school? Like, what does this question mean to our students? So um, maybe learning and digging deeper into what that question really means to our students to find out if this is an area for improvement or not, or does this have to do with engagement? So really digging in to learn a little bit more um, with that. And it's been pretty consistent with our um, parent staff groups um, in the high 80s, mid to high 80s. Um, I'm happy to report the, the question about the students in my school are kind and help, helpful. This is something that used to be in the 60s and 70 percentiles back in 2015, 16, 17. Then it was 77%, 78, and this is 82%. This is the highest this has ever been on our survey. Um, which really speaks to all the work around the PBIS and all of the work that our staff are doing around um, kindness and being kind to others. So I just want us to point that out. Um, our parents obviously think our buildings are clean, which is good. And then you get to staff and then our students. So I guess all of them have a different, you know, they see our buildings at different times in different spaces, um, but overall um, pretty positive. And this last question I think is very important. This is about the physical environment and feeling safe. So there's so much that goes on these days that you hear about school safety. And this is something that we have really focused a lot of our time and energy on over the past few years around the secure entrances in our building, our updating of our security and our camera systems and all of that. So what this is saying is Overall, you look at this, we are 90% or above in all of our um, stakeholder groups, which is saying they're feeling that our environment is safe, which is such an important part, because if you don't feel safe, it's really hard to learn. So that's another great celebration. So talked a little bit about these. So with students, um, overall, nearly all the items improved since 2022. Um, I would assume, hopefully, being off the virtual platform was part of that. Um, they're happy to be back around their friends and, and around other people. Um, feeling safe. 
Um, just seeing our leadership, our principals being visible and around, students really like that, and they've been that was very positive to them. And just the high expectations that um, our staff have for their student learning and behavior. Um, parents also very consistent with last year, overall very high scores with them also saying we have safe schools, feeling that they're safe, and that the students are recognized for the good things they have and the high expectations for the learning and behavior. And then our staff, they were very consistent with last year and overall, you know, very high in the 90 percentiles and also feeling that the environment was safe in our schools. Some opportunities for um, improvements is, you know, really figuring out what does recognition mean for our students um, and the question around looking forward to coming to school. Um, actually being kind and respectful, it was in the 80s. We always want to strive for 90. So we're, you know, continue to work on that and then the feeling of belonging. Um, I think that feeling of belonging stuck out with the students and with our parents and families. Just when you look at the overall results of the survey, um, striving for 90% or above, those are areas that we really are looking at and want to focus on moving forward. So, and that, go ahead. Do you want to do the other two? Well, and then our staff, it's just, continuing to find out ways that they like to be recognized. What we're learning is they like recognition in many different ways. So next steps is just really looking at ways we can improve to increase our participation. Um, this was perceptions of people. This is another way to get what, how people are feeling about how we're doing and what their perception is of that. Um, the more people that take our surveys, the more we learn. And then really just from, a, this will be one part, one piece of data that we'll use when we start developing our strategic, strategic actions for the upcoming school year. So, any questions? I had a couple questions. So, regarding the question about belonging, do you have the ability to break down who responded to that in regards to like socioeconomic status or race and ethnicity? I'm just wondering if that's playing a role in those students or families who might not feel like they belong. Yeah. We haven't broken it down like that. We do have the ability to based on the, the self-identified information. Um, that's something that we have talked about as a strategic action to start taking steps mm -hmm. in regards to that. And then for the question about um, look forward to coming to school, did you see a, a significant difference between like primary and secondary students? Just as someone who works primarily with secondary students, I can see that question, you know, kids don't want to go to school. And I'd be curious about a question maybe in the future around, do they feel school's important? Oh, that's a good idea. Which is really based in mm -hmm. motivation. Right. Mm -hmm. um, overall, it seemed like as they progressed in age, that's what the, I was wondering. the likely of, I think they find other things outside of school that interest them. Mm -hmm. um, so you could see that the percentage would decline over as they got older. But thank you for that feedback. Yeah, I'm just seeing that connection. I think about the work we're doing on the scheduling, and then I think about the post um, secondary education and like where our kids landing with how they feel school fits into their plans, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. post school. Mm -hmm. That might be a good way to direct it a little more. Yeah. Thanks. I'll just jump in because I had a very similar thought to Bridget, uh, which was about whether or not we had any demographic information, not just even for the student questions that were a little um, lower, but even for family and staff, like around recognition and belonging. Um, so if, I, th I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I agree with that, actually, <laughs> with, especially with all the mental health and at-risk groups and stuff right now. It'd be really interesting to see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we, we're we very um, cautious and we, we, you know, that it's, when they answer, it's confidential to them because we can't, that we can't identify who is responding in what way. But being able to see the overall demographics of what some answers are telling us, I think would be very important in helping us moving forward to improve in the district, so. Yeah, I think the, the beauty and the curse of data is that it's, it's objective, right? It just gives you the straight answer. And so I think that um, there are times when low numbers can make us feel really defensive of like the work that we're doing. And I'm hopeful and I have heard from 
you know, folks who are working in this area and who are analyzing this data, that there is this, you know, acceptance of a number that we're not super happy about, but that we are looking at it as an opportunity for growth rather than, yes. you know, a ding against mm -hmm. the great work that our staff and our students and our parents are participating in every day. So I just want to thank you guys for taking that approach. I think that that can be a little bit difficult sometimes. So I appreciate that. Well, I think overall yeah. the survey results are excellent. Mm -hmm. I mean, th we th it yeah. just shows what this district, how how well they're performing and how how the students are succeeding in everything they're doing. So, and their staff. So I think I think it's telling and it's good. So thank you. Right. Thank you. All right. All right. We left the fun for last. <laughs> the best for last. <laughs> always, always, right? Yeah. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> All right, moving on to item 9.5, Executive Director of Finance and Operations, Julie Holman, will present for approval on tonight's consent agenda, the fund balance designation. All right, good evening. I'll move, I'll move through this, so not too long. <laughs> I'm going to start um, the fund balance designation explanation with a little bit of what is school district fund balance. There was a secondary attachment to the issue paper in your um, board materials tonight, and I think it's a good reminder um, because sometimes people assume fund balance is equal to cash. So fund balance is assets, what the district owes, less the liabilities, what we owe. It consists of cash, cash equivalents, such as investments and non-cash components, such as taxes receivable, state aid, federal receivables, and payables. It is often confused as cash. However, fund balance is not the equivalent of a person's savings or checking account. It is not entirely cash that can be used for any purpose. Financial cash reserves, cash and cash equivalents, are only a portion of the fund balance. For district audit purposes, fund balance is measured on June 30th, which is our fiscal year end. It is a one-time snapshot and will include significant receivables. For example, this June 30th fund balance, which will be audited here towards the end of July and into the fall, um, has a taxes receivable of $4.9 million. Um, we always get a balance, a large balance, of our prior November tax levy for 2023 in August. So after the fiscal year is over, um, so 4.9 million of what I'm presenting tonight, we will not actually receive from the municipalities um, until August. So it's not available as cash to use for payroll or accounts payable up until after we receive that. Um, the establishment of sufficient and stable district cash reserves is considered prudent business practice and demonstrates solid financial planning sound fiscal management and a strong um, district fiscal position, which um, we've talked about before has really helped us when we go out and we borrow um, for our capital bonds to get a really good interest rate um, and to keep our Moody's rating um, up so that we get a competitive sale when that comes around. So that does play into that as well. So part of the sound management um, of the district's fund equity is to have you, the school board, annually take action to designate the purpose of the financial resources in fund equity as of that snapshot of June 30th. Well, it's not June 30th yet, so this is an estimate. The amounts contained are based on the district's review and projection of year-end fund balances. This is also a requirement of GASB 54, Government Accounting Standards Board, Statement 54, reporting the guidelines um, requiring us to use estimates of the year-end balances and to classify them into five categories. The actual fund balance will be reported after the financial audit. So again, this is estimated fund equity, and it is based on preliminary quarter four budget, which you have not actually seen yet because we're not even done with that. So I will be bringing to you at next meeting um, the quarter four revisions as of June 30th, and hopefully some of this aligns, and then we get audited, and we'll, we'll see where that lands. But this is the best estimate to date of where we are going to end up for fund equity as of June 30th. Fund equity is assigned into two categories, non-spendable and spendable. And within the spendable category, there are further classifications that depict the relative strength of the spending constraints placed on the purposes for which those resources can be used. We also have committed spending, spendable fund balance can only be authorized through board approval. 
and then non-spendable or other spendable classifications that do not require board approval. They must meet specific criteria and may be designated by an authorized designee as prescribed in policy 662.3. The balances for funds 10, 21, 30, 40, 50, and 80 are based on projections, as I said earlier. So I'll just go through the estimates for fund balance, beginning with the general fund, our largest um, operational fund, and the estimated fund balance June 30th, 2023 is $17,092,339. This is approximately 30% of um, the general fund expenditures. Um, but I will remind you, it is also about 6% lower than a year ago. And so we are drawing on fund balance currently. So when we talk deficit spending, it means we are borrowing from our savings account um, fund balance to help afford our current expenditures. So within the 17 million, we do not have a non-spendable category. I'm not sure that the school district of Ullman has ever had a non-spendable category within fund 10. Um, it's been about 15 years since GASB 54 came out with fund balance designation requirements, something that might be non-spendable if we had it could be inventory in Fund 10, <coughs> any sort of prepays. If we had an endowment where the principal portion could not be spent, those are examples, but we don't have that in the school district of Holman. Um, they restricted spendable, um, just over $800,000, and that is our sinking fund balances. We currently still have fund um, balance in the sinking funds for Prairie View, Sand Lake, and the high school addition. Um, after our new operational um, referendum goes through, which is in another year, um, then we will also have established sinking fund contributions for um, Viking, Evergreen, and the middle school. That was associated with the November referendum. The committed is spendable. 450,000 reserved, and that is for post-employment obligations for retirees. The assigned, just under 8.5 million, and that is for payroll and benefits and other payable obligations prior to our first state aid payment, which is not until September. And then the unassigned, about 7.4 million, and that's unassigned um, can be spent in any fashion, and it's just reserved for operational cash flow needs in the general fund. Next is Fund 21. This is our gift and scholarship account. Um, as I've said in our budget and budget revisions, this all depends on donations and fundraise dollars coming in and being spent throughout the year. So this number has not changed or been updated. It'll all be reconciled with all of the carryover balances budgeted as the expenditure budget for July 1st. So right now that 1.2 million is based on the current year budget and the estimated balance. Next is Fund 30, and this is our debt service voter approved, and it's um, for the retirement of principal and interest on the outstanding bonds, and that fund balance is just under 5.6 million estimate for June 30. Next is the Capital Projects Fund in Fund 40. We now have two. We have Fund 42, which is the largest fund right now with our bond and principal, or, excuse me, promissory note for the capital referendum. So that is about 48.4 million of the 48.9 million. The balance is in Fund 46, Long-Term Capital Improvement Trust Fund. Next is Fund 50, which is school nutrition. We estimate that they will end the year at about 1.8 million. And finally, Community Service Fund, or Fund 80, at 171 thousand dollars and that is the reserve dollars for our relationship with the boys and girls club for our sale to success program any questions what was the split on 40 again um the reserve for capital long-term capital improvement trust is four hundred and seventy thousand of the 48.9 so most of that are the proceeds from um the sale of the bonds and notes in february so we'll be drawing on, down on that for three years two years <laughs> in our construction yep any other questions questions is there a I think I remember this from before. Is there like a recommended percent or amount that we want to keep in fund balance or 
So the board in Holman approved 26% several years ago. And one of the reasons for that is because we were trying to avoid, which is a common reason, trying to avoid external cash flow borrowing to meet those cash flow needs throughout the year. Um, we get our state aid and our tax levy proceeds at different times in the year. And it's very typical for a Wisconsin school district to have a shortfall um, in November in advance of this December state aid. And then again, May to June in advance of a large June state aid payment. And so we were internally borrowing from our other funds within our checking account in order to make sure that we you know, weren't bouncing payroll checks and things like that. Um, so in order to avoid any short-term external borrowing and in interest costs, there was a board approved fund balance goal of 26%. So we are over that, um, estimated to be over that for June 30th again this year, but drawing down. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, other districts may have different goals. It really depends on their situation. Some districts are more heavily weighted in state aid versus levy or vice versa. And so the payments come in at different times a year and they may need more reserves to cover those times. So districts that are heavy, heavy levy aided don't get their first levy payment till January. Mm -hmm. And they're operating for six months before they get their first new certified levy payment, January, February, um, and then the balance in August. So a district like that might have a very different fund balance goal in order to meet their cash flow needs, or they might be borrowing um, for short-term purposes because between September and June, payments are pretty regular when you have most of your staff in-house, you know, the nine to 10 mm -hmm. months that the majority of staff are working, payroll's pretty consistent that way. Mm -hmm. so. All right, thanks for the explanation. And mm -hmm. thank you for putting together that extra issue paper uh, describing everything that was thank nice. Thank you. So. All right, moving on to the consent agenda. For the consent agenda, the board has been furnished with background materials on each item or has discussed it at a previous meeting. This will be acted upon with one vote without discussion. Would any board member like to like an item pulled out of the consent agenda to be discussed on or voted on separately? Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as provided. So moved. Motion by Chris. Second. Second by Khadija. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion passes. Just real quick, I have a couple um, retirements I would like to, us to celebrate. Um, two longtime employees. Uh, first, Paige Brush, she's been um, an educational assistant in, well, she's been in the health office at the middle school and has served the students and staff there for many, many years. She's going to be dearly missed, 18 and a half years. So we wish her the best in her retirement. And then also, Wendy Wadan, she is our administrative assistant at Viking Elementary, is retiring um, here. 28 and a half years um, in her role. So um, we just wish them both the best and thank them for <coughs> all that they've um, given to the school district to home and, and everyone here. So, all right. Thank you. All right. Moving on to the board debrief. I will call upon board members and ask you to present any comments <coughs> or committee reports you have. Tonight we'll start with Maggie. Um, not much from me tonight, aside from just echoing the recognition um, that's already happened. Um, and thank you to everyone who presented. Okay, Bridget. Yeah, same. Um, no committee report. Thank you for the amazing report outs tonight. And congratulations again, Travis, for your awards. <clears throat> Barb? Same. Just want to congratulate Travis again and just thank you for continuing to highlight all of the good things that are happening in our district. All right, Khadija. Uh, I want to uh, recognize that we are coming up on 4th of July, so I hope that all of our staff and families and students have a good celebration then. And we also have passed our Juneteenth celebration, so hopefully um, folks had uh, some good summer celebrations um, last week as well. Um, otherwise, I 
I don't sit on a committee currently, and I think it's incredible how many things are coming through from these committees. So I know I think it was said at our last meeting, but uh, I've been incredibly impressed with all the work that you guys have been doing. I know we're coming up on kind of the end of this process, so hopefully there's a little bit of respite coming your way. <laughs> um, but thank you guys all for the incredible work of moving all of our policies into that NEOLA framework. Um, yeah, that's what I have. Okay, Chris. Uh, tonight was just a really good nuts and bolts of how a school district works kind of meeting. So it was, I was very impressed by all the presentations and thank you for the time and effort you guys put into those. It was really good. And then Travis, you do great work. Keep it up. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, Lindsay. Yeah, I second what everybody said. Just appreciate all you guys being here. I'm always impressed at you know the hard work you do all day and then you come sit in these meetings. So appreciate that and all the presentations and all the hard work and research that you guys put into, you know, makes it easy to sit up here after you, the kind of presentations you give. And again, I would encourage people to go to Facebook. I watched all those videos today and they were, they were just so neat and moving. So good job. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mr. Myers. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That so, one was funny. <laughs> I have to see that one yet. So, um, yeah, great content tonight. I was really looking forward to this meeting tonight. Um, I, I won't be at the next meeting. Uh, Chris, to my left here, will be running the next meeting. Um, I'll be on, on vacation. Um, I want to thank the, all the officials that um, were mentioned earlier for their work at the middle and high school. We couldn't have our sports program without you, and I just really appreciate the officials that step up to help out our students. And I also want to congratulate congratulate Travis on the Telly Award. So you're, you do amazing work. So so thankful we have you. All right, moving on to 11.3. The board has been provided with notes from the April 11th Finance Committee meeting. So please look those over. Um, our upcoming board meeting schedule, our next two meetings will take place on July 10th and July 24th. And then the Facilities Committee and District Administration are advancing 34 policies to the board for first reading. If approved, the policies would be effective July 10th of 2023. Is there any other business that needs to come before the board at this time? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting. I'll second that. <laughs> Chris says move, Lindsay is seconded. To adjourn the meeting at 8.32 p.m. Motion carried. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion passes.